As we just um, spend more time looking at what you have done for us and the access that you have given us to the Father, Lord, we are so grateful for that today, Lord God. And, and um, Lord, may we, Lord, just have a better understanding of the plan that you had way back, Lord, before the foundations of the world you know, for your church. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we uh, looked at um, Christ our peace. We talked about the, the history of Israel and the separation between Jew and Gentile and how really for the, um, the Jews that led to a bit of pride and, and arrogance. Um, we really see that when uh, Jesus is taught, I mean, Jesus was um, born a Jew, but yeah, when he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you could see there's just this level of um, pride and arrogance. I, I'm amazed to read at times that they tried to trap him. <laughs> you know, it actually says there that you know they thought how they were going to trap Jesus, and I just think that's phenomenal. You know, and uh, I love how Jesus often would uh, they'd ask him a question, so he'd answer it with a question which they couldn't answer or didn't want to answer, so it silenced them. Um, but this pride and arrogance um, caused them to look down on Gentiles, and and uh, in the passage we read, there are words like. Um, the Gentiles are uncircumcised, aliens, strangers, far off, not part of the Commonwealth of Israel, foreigners. And so there was all this, always this division that was there. They saw themselves as the children of Israel. They were God's chosen people. Everyone else was outside of that. If you wanted to be part of God's chosen people, there were all these rituals and things that you had to do. One of them was you had to get circumcised and you were called a proselyte coming in and being a part of it. But the blessing had to, was coming through the Jews. And um, yet in, in Jesus, we know there is no division. Amen? Jesus came and broke down that middle wall of division. And we saw uh, an image last week that even at the temple, uh, in the outer court, there was a place called the Court of the Gentiles, and there was literally a middle wall of separation. There was a wall there that Gentiles could not get past. And so they weren't allowed even to part of the outer court and then definitely not into the inner court. And of course, we know only one man was actually allowed into the Holy of Holies once a year. And so the, the Jews didn't have access to the presence of God, but definitely the Gentiles, they were well outside. And so, um, and then we read in verse 18, it says, For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. There's the Trinity there. Through him, Jesus Christ, we have access by one spirit to the the Father. And so now, because of what Jesus has done, that Gentiles have access to God that was only available to the Jew, and the Jews have access to God that was only available to the high priest once a year. And the Bible says that that brings peace. Who knows that having access to the Father actually is what brings peace. And then we read in verse uh, 19 of two, um, Ephesians last week, So now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So that's where we're picking up this, this morning, uh, this scripture in verse 19. So I'll read it again. So it says, Therefore you are now no longer strangers, foreigners, and you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of of the household of God. It means now we are part of God's kingdom. What a, what a great thing that was for um, Gentiles. No longer they had to go through this system and there was a big debate about that in Acts. Uh, it was called the Council of Jerusalem. In fact, um, uh, let's, just, let's just go there for a moment. I think it's in Acts 20. Uh, because there was this big debate and because as Gentile, all these Gentiles were starting to uh, come in to, uh, you know, get saved, and they didn't know what to do about it. <laughs> um, because there was a system about if you were outside the Jews, how you came in, and, and it was as a proselyte, and you had to do all these different things, and circumcision and all that. Yet because of Jesus, all these people were getting saved, and were just um, coming in. And um, let's have a look. Uh, okay, we might we'll, we'll go there later because I um, I'll just tell you what it was. So 
when they were coming in, they had this debate, and Paul came to see the disciples, and um, there was this debate. James was the head of the church at the time, and there was this debate about whether we were going to let them in on the basis that they're getting saved through Jesus Christ, or whether they had to still come through these rituals. And Peter gets up and he says, you know, for years and years we've been trying to put this law onto you know, our forefathers and, and generations, which no one would keep. And he said, I believe that we will actually be saved by grace the same way that they are. Amen? So that was a landmark thing, that it was actually salvation by grace and not through all these um, rituals. So if anyone can find that for me, that would be great. And um, we can read that. 15? Great, thank you. Okay, so let's go there, chapter 15. Yep, thanks, thanks John. So it... Um, it says here in verse 7, when Peter had, um, there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said, The men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by the mouth of Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. That's huge. <laughs> That's that same thing. There's no distinction anymore. There's no middle wall of separation. And God had done that because he'd saved them. He'd given them the Holy Spirit. And it was evident. And then it says, um, there, Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And then the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders of God had worked, that worked through them and the Gentiles. And after they become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take, them out, to take out of them a people for his name. And with these words, and the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. It will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. And so the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Amen. So yeah, that's so significant for us. We wouldn't be here worshipping and fellowshipping and worshipping God if this hadn't happened, if this wasn't a part of history. And um, what a blessing that, that was and that, you know, we don't have to go to Israel, we don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. We can worship God 24-7 and uh, praise God there is no middle wall of separation. And then verse 20 in Ephesians, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And interesting enough, we sang that song this morning. I didn't choose the songs, by the way. Sandra chose the songs. In fact, she said we're going to do a, a song in Christ alone, and I thought it was a totally different song. And when we got here, she said, oh, no, we're doing, it's called Cornerstone. I said, brilliant, because that's in my message today. <laughs> and so that's, uh, that's always how the Holy Spirit just sets things up. So uh, 1 Corinthians 3.11, and if you, when you go for morning tea, if you have a look on our, um, uh, on our foundation, you'll actually see on our um, the deck there at the bottom, we've actually got a couple of scriptures there, and one of them is this one. And it says, No other foundation can be laid other than which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to talking about that uh, he's the foundation, and we build on that with gold, silver, and precious stones. So... Christ is the foundation. You know, there's a, a, a church uh, one time, I don't know where it was, but uh, it had this sign out the front and it said, uh, we preach Christ crucified. And then this vine started to grow up and covered part of the sign and then it just said, we preach Christ. And then the vine kept growing and then it just said, we preach. <laughs> the thing is, is that we preach Christ crucified. Amen. I get annoyed when I actually hear that some people preach that there is no resurrection or they preach them, you know, or they don't even, um, you know, it's not central about Jesus. And so, you know, or it's, or it's a, a lifestyle or it's a, a motivational speech. You know, if it's not about Jesus, it's not worth it. Amen? Because he is the foundation. You know, if this, and we know that, um, you know, if you, when I was in Christchurch, they do get a lot of earthquakes there, 
and um, this company was making these big rubber um, discs that they put in the foundation so that if, if there was an earthquake, the, the actual building could sustain um, that earthquake. And it was all built in the foundations. And you know, whenever they're, they're building, you can see how deep they go. And a lot of the, the foundations, once the building's up, you never see. But had, depending on how good the foundations are is how actually good the building's going to withstand the pressures and the storms. Amen? And so, and you know, I've, I've got to say as a pastor is that when, you know, when life throws its storms at you, you really see what people's foundations are built on. And sometimes they're very shaky. And even people that I've known for a long time, um, their, their foundations can actually get very shaky, especially if they believe that things happen based on how much they pray and based on what they do. It's not based on what you do. It's all based on what he's done. Amen? And so we can go through the storms. I mean, our family's been through a major storm, but you know, no matter what's happened, we've kept our eyes on Jesus and we've kept our focus on him. And you know, there are times when you... When, uh, you, you actually, some, um, somebody said one time, the, the, um, the greatness of faith is actually when nothing is happening. And so, you know, we can have lots of faith when everything's happening and things are going well and the sun is shining and everything's going great. But where's your faith when the storms come? Or where's your faith when nothing is happening? It's just like there's nothing. You know, and, um, yeah, that's the thing with... Um, yeah, Sandra's laughing because <laughs> that's what should have been on a bus going around the country by now. But, you know, um, look at Abraham. You know, he, God told him what was going to happen. He was very specific about what was going to happen and changed his name and everything that, you know, from, you know, to his name being Father of Nations. And so, you know, here he is. He cried out because he said, I've got no successor. And, and he said, this is what I'm going to do for you. And he, and he never asked Ab Abraham for anything in return. And he changed his name from Abram to Abraham so that even in his name was his destiny of what was going to happen. But when nothing was happening, then he tried to give God a hand. How many of us fall into that trap? Because that's the greatness of faith is continually to trust in God, to continually to say, and you know, when, when our daughter, you know that our daughter, the night before she actually had a brain aneurysm, had a word from God of what God, what God was going to do in her life, how she was going to do music, and it all lined up with other prophetic words she'd had before. And you know what? That's what I held on to. Because I'm like, well, you can't do those things if you're dead. You can't do those things if um, you know, this brain aneurysm takes you out. So I'm holding on what God said to you the night before. He spoke destiny over her life. You can't have a destiny if you're lying in a grave. Is that true? And so, so you know, now there, are time, there were two times when we felt that we lost her. Actually, Paul Shannon, the night before, we, um, before he left, um, she was just, you know, sick and vomiting green stuff and saying she was going to die. It wasn't a nice way for him to leave. But, you know, imagine how that was for him, 16 hours in a plane, not knowing what she was going to be like. And I know that Shannon would have had to hold on to God and just say, God, you, you've said that this is what you're going to do and this is the destiny that you have for her life. And that's what we, we put our trust in. Amen? You know, we, we don't... We don't put our, well the Bible says we don't put our trust in chariots and horses, we put our trust in God because ultimately he is the one who's going to come through. And how many people know that often when God says that something's going to happen, it goes in totally the opposite direction. You know, there are times when nothing happens, but there are times when it goes in the opposite direction. But you know, when an archer has a bow in his hand, do you know that um, he pulls it further away from the target just before it hits the target? Just before that bow, when it's actually relaxed there, it's actually closer to the target. But when he actually, he has to pull it away from the target to actually hit it. And often God will um, you know, allow things just to go in different directions because when it does happen, we know that it's God and not being anything of ourselves. Amen? That's the wonderful grace of God. So let's go to um, verse 20, Ephesians 20. So having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself the chief cornerstone. So Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected that has become the chief cornerstone. So that's a quote from uh, Psalm 118, verse 22. Um, that's referred to here in Ephesians 2.20. And if you're taking notes, it also comes up in Mark 12.10. Jesus actually says that himself. And it comes up in Acts 4.11. So there's three other, th three references you know, 
I love the I love the Old Testament because most of the New Testament is just quoting the Old Testament anyway. <laughs> and so there's three references to where this comes up from Psalm 118, verse 22. Let's let's read it from there. 118, verse 22. says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it's marvellous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made and we'll rejoice and be glad in it. Now, there's three ways that a cornerstone is used. It can be used as the, the foundation, at the first stone that's laid that actually joins two walls. And that can be seen as Jew and Gentile coming together. Again, as long as that cornerstone is actually in, you know, is right and in the right place, then the whole building will actually line up. And you can see that as, um, the two walls is Jew and Gentile coming together so that this um, uh, temple can be built. But it's also um, referred to as a keystone, you know, when there's an arch, um, that the keystone is the last one that goes in. It's the highest stone, but it's the one that actually holds everything together. If you take that out, the, the arch disappears or crumbles and falls down. So Jesus is the, the highest stone, but him in place holds everything together. And then another thing it's called is the capstone. So, you know, like if you have a pyramid, the, the last stone that goes on the top that actually joins all the walls together is the capstone. So Jesus Christ is... The cornerstone. He's the one that actually holds everything together and every, that everything is actually built upon. And then in verse 21 to 22 it says, In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of, the, in, of God in the Spirit. You know, you know how amazing this is? It, last week we were talking about how um, that the Jews could only get in part way to the temple. The Gentiles couldn't even get into the temple. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we are the temple. <laughs> what an amazing transition. Not only now do they have access into something they could never get to before, not only do they have access into the presence of God, but now actually the presence of God is actually dwelling in us. So we become the temple. That's that's huge. That's a, a major shift. That's a major transition from just being, you know, for years, years and years, um, no, no Jew could get into the Holy of Holies. No Gentile could get into the temple. They all wanted to get to the presence of God. They couldn't get there. Jesus opened it up. He actually um, abolished the middle wall of separation. He broke, he broke the, temp, the um, curtain in two so we could have access. But even at that stage, the idea was, oh, Okay, so now we can go to a temple and actually get access to God. But Jesus took it so much further and said, no, the Holy Spirit now is dwelling in you. And Paul said, you are the temple of God, so you don't even have to come to Jerusalem. You don't even have to come to this temple that you couldn't come to before. Wherever you are, that's where the temple of God is. Amen? That is a major transition. That's a major move away from just something that they thought was an amazing thing. God took it so much further and made us the temple of God. So what's, what is a temple? It's a meeting place of God with his people. It's a place where God dwells. It's a place that is holy and set apart from the world and it's a place for the centre of praise and worship and adoration. And that's who you are, amen? You are the place where God dwells. The wonderful thing is that that's why you need to get out there more, because the more you get out there, the more God is actually <laughs> out there amongst the people. You know, Jesus said, don't, don't hide what you have, and, you know, don't hide it under a bushel, don't hide it. You know, we need, because, you know, the, because God has multiplied. That was the amazing thing. That's what the enemy didn't know, that when he thought he had the victory when he got Jesus, and Jesus said, no, I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit, and he will be multiplied many times over and then um, available 24-7. Amazing, isn't it? So we couldn't, get, we couldn't even get near the dwelling place of God and now we are the dwelling place of God. What an amazing thing. So let's move into Ephesians chapter 3 and um, verses 1 to 5. So Paul's about to reveal a mystery. Now, um, if you've heard me talk before, a mystery in the Bible doesn't mean something that you'll never find out. It's actually something that was, was hidden, but now is revealed. And God's, God's revealed it to his people. 
And so he's about to reveal a mystery that is not even talked about in the Old Testament. And so, um, verse 1, so it says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by, revel by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've briefly written already, but went, which you read and you may understand by knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in age, the ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is, has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So he's talking now about the mystery of the church that was not made known to the sons of men. It wasn't even made known in the Old Testament. Yes, there was about the Jew and Gentile coming together, and we see that through um, the different feasts. And there was, but again, the concept was always that Jew and Gentile would come together, but Gentiles would be blessed through the Jewish line, through the Jewish um, race, and through being the children of God. But there was no mention about the fact that one day there would be the church where all that would be broken down and we'd all stand together as brothers and sisters and have access to the Father. So this was that mystery. And then in verse 6 it says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So that was good news. <laughs> so God just keeps upping it. First of all, he made, he broke down, Jesus broke down the wall of separation. He gave them access to the Father. Um, you know, they wouldn't have known that, oh, great, we got to the temple. And then when they get to the temple, they realise the curtain's actually torn in two. They can actually have access right into the Holy of Holies. They're thinking, man, this is great. This, our, our, all our Christmases have come at once. <laughs> and they think, that's, that's really good. Then they find out that, wow, well, not only that, but when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, we actually now are the dwelling place of, and we are the temple of God. We are the dwelling place of um, the presence of God. But then they find out something else. Now there's a new dispensation that has started since Jesus came and no longer is it Jew and Gentile, but it's actually called the church, which is Jew and Gentile standing together with fellow heirs and part of the same body and partakers. And they said, this is the gospel. That's great news. Amen? Gospel means good news. And then Paul says, I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he starts talking about now, okay, not only do we get saved, not only um, can we have access to the Father, not only is the Spirit of God dwells in me. Not only is there this new thing called the church, so it's no longer Jew and Gentile, it's not about only one race or one nation are the children of God, but all those who accept Jesus Christ are the children of God and are co-heirs and have the same inheritance. But now Paul's starting to talk about there's these gifts and he actually was given a gift by the grace of God and so that he could actually preach this message to them. And so when we look at uh, Romans 12.3, we start to see about these gifts. And so Romans 12.3-8 to 8 says, For I say to you, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Can you see how that lines up with what we just read? Because Paul said, I've got given this gift a gift to be able to preach the gospel, to share this amazing news. But he says, I am the least of the least, but God gave me the grace to do this. And so he says this here, similar in Romans. He talks to us to talk about these, these grace gifts. But before I start to tell you about them, something that you need to know, that God has given to each one a measure of faith, has given gifts by his grace, but we are to not think of ourselves highly, but to think of ourselves soberly. And um, as God is, God's the one who's dealt the gift. And then he says, um, so we being as um, many are one body in Christ, individual members of one another, having then gifts gift differing according to the grace that is given. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us use them to prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use them in ministering. He who teaches in teaching, who exhorts in exhortation, who gives with liberality, who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So he's talking about now 
not only have we got we've been saved we have access to the father we have the holy spirit dwelling in us we're actually now um, all part of the children of god there's no separation but god's actually given us these gifts that he gives by his grace when we get saved and so but he says you know basically we are to allow those gifts to be developed however don't own them because they're not from you (laughs) they're actually from god they're actually a gift of grace grace means undeserved unmerited favor and so you know, I often say, you know, God has given me a gift to, to um, uh, preach, but God has given other people gifts to serve, and no one gift is better than another. Amen? Just because someone's on a platform here doesn't mean that th- this gift is a higher gift, because I couldn't do what I'm doing here if other people weren't doing what they do. Amen? And we, that's part of the body. We all work together, and we have to see, see that, that and think of that soberly. And then he goes on in verse 9 of um, chapter 3. And he says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery from which the, from the beginning of ages was hidden in God who created all things through Christ Jesus to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the church and to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord. That is a very interesting um, passage of scripture. Because what are the principalities and powers in heavenly places? Well, we see that further on in um, Ephesians chapter 6. We'll have a look at that. Best way to interpret the Bible is to allow the Bible to interpret itself. In 6.12 it says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the dark age, of this and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So now what he's saying is that Paul's saying, I've come to preach that there's this uh, mystery that was hidden in Christ and when he came and died, um, the, the power of God that's available to the church is to be displayed against principalities and powers in heavenly places. Amen? So it just keeps getting better. <laughs> you know, they, they can get access, we can get access to the Father, we're saved, we have an inheritance, we're part of the children of God, we are at the a living temple of God. Uh, God has given us um, gifts by his grace that, that we can use, and in using them, they, we're working the effective power of God against principalities and powers in heavenly places. Isn't that great? And that's what the church does. In fact, um, I love what Jesus said in Matthew 16 and verse 18. He says this, he says, he's talking to Peter, he said, I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, which was the rock was the confession that Jesus Christ is, is uh, the son of the living God, that's the foundation, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, sometimes people read that scripture that like, oh, you know, that, that Hades won't prevail against the church that the gates won't come against the church. Do you know what? Gates don't move. (laughs) It's not actually saying that. It's actually saying that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. When the church is moving forward and the church is coming up against Hades, that the Hades cannot prevail against the church. Amen? That's actually what it's saying. And that's what, what he's saying in Ephesians, is that... You've been, you now have the, the Spirit of God, you've got the presence of God, that Shekinah glory is actually dwelling inside of you, and when you, you, and you come together as a body in the church, you come together with gifts, and um, you start working the effective power of God in your life and through the church, and the gates of Hades cannot prevail against the church moving forward in that power of Jesus Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. And so they'd seen, they'd seen Jesus come and they'd seen one man come and do healing and do, um, do things. But now they were actually starting to see in Acts that God was using his church and through his church people were getting saved and through his church people were getting healed and people were getting set free. And, and um, Peter, Peter even said, why, why are you looking at us like it's something we've done? This is Jesus Christ, the one you crucified, who's working effectively through us to actually come against the kingdom of darkness. Amen? Hallelujah. And so um, we'll finish on, uh, well, we'll wind up here and then I'm going to pray um, Paul's prayer. 
that he does in, from verse 14. Uh, but verse 12 to 13. And this continues just to keep getting better. So verse 12 says this. Um, it says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. So then he goes, he goes on, he, he sort of finishes this, this passage by saying that this access that you have to the Father, you can come with boldness and confidence through your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? The Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. We don't come boldly and confidently because of our confidence in us. If, I, if my confidence was just based in me, I could not come boldly to the throne of grace. I could not come with confidence to, to the throne of grace. But because my faith is in him, because I know that I stand in his righteousness, and it's not based on what I've done. You know, we, we sort of think, oh, you know, I can come boldly if I've been good today. You know, if I've had a good week, if I've been praying and doing all these things, I can come pretty boldly to God. But, you know, if I've been playing up or misbehaving, I can't really come that confidently to God. Well, you know what? The fact is you can. And it's not based on what, what you do. You know, I, I love talking about, you know, Paul loves talking about Abraham. And um, because the Judaizers love to talk about Abraham and how, you know, what an amazing person he was. And he said, yeah, I don't know if he was that amazing really. I mean, he, he had faith in God, but he didn't have trust. You know, when God said, go to a place where I'll show you, he had faith to go. But when he got there and saw there was no food, he kept going. <laughs> he went down to Egypt because he knew there was food there. So really, was he, you know, he was pretty human, really. And then when he got there, he lied and, you know, he told a half-truth and said that, oh, this, you know, Sarah, tell him that you're my sister. And uh, do you know, 20, you think 20, after 20 years, he would have worked that one out. But he, 20 years later, he did exactly the same thing with King, King Abimelech. But you know what happened when he actually went down to Egypt? That God gave a uh, you know, message to Pharaoh not to touch this man because he was righteous. And so he sent him out of there with livestock and with... Uh, yeah, and yeah, we talk about how Abraham is wealthy. He's wealthy, but did he do it by doing the right thing? No, he did it by doing the wrong thing. <laughs> but God's grace and favour was, was on his life even when he didn't deserve it. Amen? And, and that's the thing with us. It's not that we... Um, oh, okay, well, I can do whatever I like because of that. In fact, it's because of that. It's because of the fact that aside from ourselves and how we are, we can still come confidently um, to the, and have access to God that it actually makes us then want to actually worship him and live our lives according to you know, the love that he has for us. That's what it actually does for us. Amen? So Hebrews 4... Um, 16, because it reminds us of that scripture in Hebrews, which says, also says we can come boldly to the throne room of grace. 4.16 It says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find help, find grace and help in a time of need. When do we need it the most? Yeah, normally when we've mucked up. <laughs> Remember last week we talked about the rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod actually protects us from the enemy, but the staff actually protects us from ourselves. It's what the shepherd uses when the sheep get caught in the bushes. He actually uses it to actually draw them out of the bushes and closer to himself. That's our time of need. Yes, we have an enemy, but our, also our enemy is ourselves. We get ourselves into trouble. And so what the enemy would like you to do is think, well, you got yourself into that trouble. You can get it out. Don't, don't ask God for help. You should have asked him before you got yourself in trouble. Now that you are in trouble, don't go asking God for help. But he actually says that's the very time that you need to. That's the very time when you're in need that you can call out to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm in a lot of strife here. I need your help. You can come boldly to the throne room of grace. Why? Because of your faith in him. Amen? So, in summary, we were foreigners, we were strangers, without God, without hope in this world, but through the blood of Jesus, we have direct access to the Father. We have the presence of God dwelling in us. We are not... We are... Um, we are part of the body of Christ, and which is united all over the world. We have a citizenship that is in heaven. We have, he has given us grace gifts. We can um, know the mysteries of Christ. We can um, make known the power of God to principalities and powers, and the gates of hell cannot prevail 
against the church. Amen? Is that exciting? I think that's just, just keep getting better and better. And I'm just going to finish uh, from verse 14 to the end of the chapter. Paul basically is saying a prayer here. And so he prays this over us. I'm going to pray this over you this morning. So it says this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, and the depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you. Such an encouragement, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. You did so much when you came and died for us, Lord God. You had your children, the children of Israel, a nation, but now you have a church, Lord God, which is um, unified all over the world. Your Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We just thank you for that, Lord God. We thank you for that access now that we have with the Father and how the peace that that brings, Lord God. Lord, that we can turn to you through your Holy Spirit, Lord, and get wisdom and guidance and, and knowledge. And, and Lord, how we can come against principalities and powers. Lord, as your church, Lord God, um, storms the gates of hell and plunders hell and pl um, populates heaven, Lord God. And Lord, that we can... Um, uh, Lord, that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and that um, you display your power through the church, Lord. Lord, we just thank you that you are building us. You are the chief cornerstone, and you are building us into a holy habitat, Lord God, that will eventually accumulate in heaven, Lord, where we will be in your presence 24-7. Um, we thank you for that, Lord God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that it brings. In Jesus' name, amen.